Hey, hey everyone, this is Mike and I'm back with another episode of the Muscle for Life podcast. And in this episode, I interview Brett Contreras, who's a scientist, author, coach, and really one of the leaders of the evidence-based fitness movement and an all-around pretty cool dude to boot. Now, if you've heard of Brett already, you probably know him as the glute guy that can teach you everything you need to know about building a great butt. And while that's true, that's not what I wanted to talk to him about because, well, I figured he might enjoy a change of pace. So that's why this interview is about something else altogether. In it, I chat with Brett about nutrition and exercise science and get his thoughts on all kinds of things ranging from what makes for good and bad science to how to become more scientific in your own thinking to his favorite researchers and labs and how to reconcile conflicting studies and more. And I wanted to do this interview because these days there are more and more fitness quote-unquote gurus that are appealing to science to sell their ideas and sell their products and services and so forth. And it's just getting harder and harder for everyday people to distinguish the hucksters from the genuine articles. So I hope you find Brett's thoughts on these subjects insightful. And here's the interview. Brett, thanks for coming on the show. I'm excited to have you. Thanks, Mike. I'm excited as well. Yeah, no, it was great talking. You know, before it's 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 fun to meet people that are like minded, and like we were saying, it's kind of hard to come across sometimes in this space. So I'm looking forward to our conversation here. Me too. I think we could have <laughs> spoken for three hours, and that could have been a, maybe that's, that could have been another podcast. It would have been like random thoughts on random things, but somebody <laughs> would have found it. At least somebody would have laughed a few times. We may have had a censor out a few things. <laughs> nah, nah, who cares? Whatever. Just put the explicit <laughs> label on it and then move on. <laughs> All right. So let's get into this talk, which is uh, going to be on the subject of, I mean, we don't have to say necessarily exercise science because even nutrition science is, is, can be confusing to people. But, you know, if we look at the, the health and fitness space on the whole, we're seeing more and more people that are appealing to science to sell their ideas and their methodologies. And I think this is good on the whole. Um, I think it's a, at least it's a good trend, but it also is, is creating a lot of confusion for just, you know, everyday people that are looking to get into shape because on the surface, when, if you're just like somebody who doesn't really know that much and you're trying to educate yourself, it might seem that science s supports all kinds of conflicting opinions and methodologies and ideas about how to eat and train and supplement. And the average person is not, they're not able, they don't know much about scientific research. So it's not like they can just dive in and form their own judgments on, you know, what what's right and wrong. And it's easy then just to get lost and like, who do I listen to? What, you know, who's, what science is good and what science is bad. And so I get, I get asked about this fairly often, so much so that I actually, um, later in the year, I would like to, excuse me, something I would love to talk to you about actually, um, uh, produce a, a simple kind of course to just increase people's scientific literacy a little bit and help them understand a bit more about how research is conducted and designed and conducted and and you know just for the people that really want to be able to uh, go to the next step of educating themselves. But um, anyways, this is here. Here's a this is our initial foray into it. So I was going to kind of pass it over to you. So why is it? Why does why does this? I wouldn't say it's just exercise too. I'd say nutrition as well because you have guys like Gary Taubes out there who says now that like anyone that talks about calories in, calories out is basically a quack and this is like, you know, these are the relics of uh, our scientific, our, the, the ignorant past and now we know it's all about insulin or this, that or whatever. And so that confuses people and then, you know, it just kind of goes on from there, right? Like if we're still arguing about energy balance, then we can argue about everything. So there's so many aspects to this question yeah and i we can talk the whole time on this it's so important yep and it's such a and and it's something i think uh, <laughs> there's nothing out there so i agree there does, does need to be a product i've i've put together an outline already on oh, how really? how to become more scientific and That's smart. so the the one thing i want to say right off the bat is Think about when you first started lifting weights. We sucked. Our form sucked. Nothing felt right. I was uncoordinated. Um, I'm sure most people can relate. You didn't just start, especially compound movements. Yeah. You didn't start doing squats and going, God, this feels so smooth. Yeah. I wanted to round back my deadlifts. I wanted to shoot my hips up in the squat. The bench felt so wobbly. 
I couldn't stabilize the Remember bar. Remember the and, shaking bench days? Or yeah. like, uh. <laughs> Over time, you get coordinated and you get used to it. It was just like anything. When you start anything, you're not, you know, public speaking. You're not, nat- you're not yeah, great it's, at it's it. It's right uncomfortable. Away. I mean, you get better at things. And that's the same way science works. You get better at it. But you have to start somewhere. So how do you start out as a scientist? And like what you said, there's so many conflicting things. How do you make your own how do you make your own decision? Come to your own yeah, conclusion. As a, as a layman too, where like, you know, they're never it's they're not gonna have a PhD like you, they never will. Oh, right. That fortunately they don't nest they don't need to at least to navigate, I think to learn to navigate the space and avoid, you know, coming to the conclusion that eating 15 avocados a day is the secret to everything or something. You know what I mean? So I think the, the, you want, the goal should be for everyone to become their own authority, become your own guru. Like Mm -hmm. don't, don't listen to the, don't, you don't, you like, but I shouldn't say that because, um, knowledge is so, uh, specified now, like so niched. It's, I can't, I, I have a research review and I did this on purpose. And I remember telling my my partner Chris Beardsley, who I do, the co- co-founder, Chris Beardsley, who I do it with. I said, no matter how popular I ever get, or if we, I start making way more money, I never want to outsource this because yeah, doing this each month, I go through 92 journals every month. Wow! And these are journals in strength and conditioning, biomechanics, physiology, anatomy, motor control. Yeah, so that's how you keep yourself um, sharp. That's physical how you therapy, stay. Yeah, physical therapy, nutrition, sports medicine. So it's all all aspects of health and fitness. And even then, the guys who I speak with around the world, Brad Schoenfeld knows more than I do about hypertrophy physiology. Hmm. I know more about biomechanics, but that's why we get along because our stuff jives with one another. Yeah. Alan Aragon is my go-to guy with the nutrition stuff, but – even we have researchers we look up to and and mm-hmm. they know more about certain things but they might not know how it applies to bodybuilders or something you know sure. so it's like yeah. so there's there's guys who will know more practical things there's guys who know more scientific things there's guys who are better communicators of the science and so you have to have people who you trust i have my trusted team but even then i've caught them <laughs> we're all wrong about things yeah. brad Brad's my one of my best buddies, um, and I don't agree with everything he says. I just know his intentions are true. He's a good scientist, and he would change his mind given enough evidence. You yeah. mentioned Gary Tobbs earlier. I, I was there when Alan Aragon debated Gary Tobbs, and Alan said, just out of curiosity, Gary, if enough evidence came out against this you know, sh- sugar being the root of all evils, would you change your mind? And he said, no, would you? So that, that there, like, end of story. <laughs> What? He said that in front of a big crowd of people, and it's like, okay, that's, so what is that? that uh, that's just like, uh, uh, wait a minute, uh, like, did you just say that on live TV, kind of thing? You just say that, right? So it was like, when you hear that, that person's no longer a scientist; they are a fanatic, they are a whatever. You know, you're a charlatan, you're a guru, you're a well, guru is actually a good meaning. We, I've turned it into mean a negative thing, but um, right. But like I, I, no, I mean, at that point, it's more about selling an ideology than yeah, it's just doing science. You're looking to defend your, you know, to confirm your bias. You're not looking to 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 uncover the truth. But yeah. anyway, I mean, there's a there's a funny quote. I don't know who I got from, but basically, like, it's if it's in someone's if, if someone's like livelihood depends on not understanding something, don't expect them to ever understand it. It's just like so when you build your, you know, as a personal as a person, when, especially if you're out making money and your whole brand revolves around something that'll that 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 that, that I don't that person's never abandoning that ever right I mean well it's funny because I'm popular in the industry for my glute stuff and my hip thrust exercises and I publish research on it but I've been asked to peer review two papers on hip thrust now and I have to be very impartial and I have to say oh god am I yeah am I being uh am Am I I seeing what I want to see partial right so I, ha- I work very hard to be impartial. And it's hard because, yeah, my popularity is based on this. W- what if, you know, there's there's a, a some colleagues I heard of a study showing that bar- they did heavy barbell hip thrust for eight weeks and it didn't improve sp- speed development. And mm-hmm. I've, been co- I've been coming out with this, so I haven't seen the paper yet, but if it gets published, I have to say, okay, 
why is this? First of all, I did a I did a study for my PhD thesis that showed that it did improve mm. sprint speed. So what's the? How do we reconcile these? But ultimately, if I'm if I'm a scientist, then there's no emotions. It's just logic. It's just science. It's no. There's no. How dare you, researchers, come across, you know, like publish this? It yeah. can't be true. It's thank you guys for, you know, adding, conducting yeah, adding, the study. Adding, adding you, to you the added collective this, understanding. Yep, you added to the collective understanding, and uh, hopefully a couple more studies come out, yep. and then we can figure out maybe it works well for a certain population yep. or a stage of development. Maybe it works well when you combine it with this. Um, you know, we we have there's so much more research that needs to be done just in that area, but. Anyway, so you want to have your trusted people, but even then, even with like Alan Aragon, I might go to him for like, you know, nutrition related stuff like meal timing and everything. And, um, but if I really want to form my own opinion, I have to pull up all the research and read the studies myself yeah. and yeah. scrutinize their methodology and then, you know, read the discussions, read what the authors had to say. Talk to Alan about it, and then you know you might because you might find something unique in that in those studies where you're like, hmm, every time they did this, this happened. So you might come to a slightly different conclusion. That yep. happens a lot. Yeah. And well, let me tell you about just the guys in strength and conditioning, just the guys who study hypertrophy science. There's myself. There's Brad Schoenfeld. There's Stu Phillips. There's Greg Knuckles, uh, Andrew Vygotsky, Eric Helms, James Krieger. Uh, who else? <clears throat> we all disagree with each other, all of us. Yeah, in different um, on different things, sure. Menno, Menno, Hanselman, yeah, like we all disagree with each other on certain things, and we've all read the same studies, but we all have different practical experiences. We have different genetics. We have different experiences training ourselves, training others. Yep. Different interpretations of the same data. Yeah. You know, Menno and Eric uh, argue about protein. They help. They know these studies like the back of their hand, and they. They just interpret it differently, but they're both scientists. I trust them both. I know they're not um, lying. I mean, also, about, what we but, are looking at like they're not arguing that you need to eat pro. They're not, they're not saying that like no, you didn't. You don't need proteins. You, you just need Brazil nuts. Right, like, right. <laughs> they're, they're they're arguing about whether it's you know like whether it's like point. Seven grams exactly. per pound of body versus or a gram, which is kind of funny because people email me on that in particular. Because I, I, I generally I tell people eh, if you're around 0.8 to one gram per pound, you're good. There's maybe a little bit of evidence if you're if you're somebody that's muscular and you're lean and you want to get really lean that eating a bit more might be beneficial. But you know, so I get people that will email me not to challenge me to be like, well, what about like this 0.7 or whatever? I'm like, honestly, okay. I mean, fine if you want, but like, if you, is it really that big of a, do we really care? Like, you know, the like, grand scheme of things, that's not right. And, and I think there, we talk about flexible dieting and it's like your protein should be flexible a little bit. Yeah. You don't need to be so hardcore that every day I get one gram per pound. Yeah. You, you, people get so caught up with their macros that they, yeah. You can be flexible with your macros. Yeah. So that's why I'm like, I tell people, like, how about this? Just be around a gram of, per pound yep. per day and give or take some, and I think you're going to be fine. <laughs> it's like a three day rolling average. If one yeah. day you're at 0.7, one day you're at 1.2, it's fine. But that's a whole other topic. So, about yep. this science thing. Um, so, yeah. So, like, just for example, um, I just know even from someone years ago when I first kind of got into the more of the evidence-based and away from what I decided to really educate myself on really is so if you're looking at the landscape out there, one of the things that, you know, I first had to, to get a sense of is uh, a bit of the basics of scientific research. And, you know, we'll talk about, for example, like, cause it, at first when I was kind of from a, a newbie, basically outside looking in or I'd be like, so how exactly does that work? Where like you have, you know, this study is going to conclude one thing and this study is going to conclude the exact opposite. So like, you know, there's some, sometimes people, I'll even get emailed with people, send me email, some study and they'll be like, see, look, you can't build muscle on low reps. This showed that, uh, and then on the other hand, you can't build muscle on high reps. See this. And, and then, and so that's confusing for people. Maybe you can lend a little bit of insight in terms of what's going on behind the scenes with, yep. you know, study design and execution. And then there's well, even before, even before we get into the study design sure. stuff, Let's talk about the process of trying to become more scientific because okay. that's hard. So I, 
I, you follow my evolution in the fitness industry. I was a personal trainer on the side. I was a high school math teacher. And eventually I realized I want to do this full time. But I was mainly a personal trainer. I did not have higher – I had a master's degree in education, curriculum instruction. I had no experience with reading scientific literature. But I was always a scientifically minded person. My grandpa was an engineer. He gave me like – you know, I'd always loved science, but he gave, he got me a subscription to Discover Magazine and books by like Einstein and Richard Feynman or yeah, Feynman, how you say it like. Yeah. <clears throat> so I was scientifically minded, but even then, and I can tell you're the same way, Mike, you're very scientifically minded, but we had to go through that whole, you first start searching online and you come, you first, the first people you're going to come across are the more markety types yep. who know the right search terms and stuff. Yep. And you stumble on their blogs and their writings, and then you you take it as gospel because they're very convincing. And also, and, they might also look the look. Like you look, you're like, hey, I don't know. I mean, it'd be like if you're trying to get into golf and you someone's really good at golf, you're going to be like, yo, so like, teach me something, right? Because you're obviously so good at this. That's so true. If they look the part, if they're shredded, or are they the, f- females want. To, to do the program of the, the, the pro, whoever has the body they like most, they want to be doing her program. Men do that too, but even more so with females. And but there's such a genetic component to things that person made. Well, I always do this in my seminars. I show them Jen Selter. She's popular for her butt, uh, her belly. It's so probably butt, fake so. though, right? I mean, come on. I think it's, it's real, you but think so? she just has such good. Yeah, I do. It's, hmm. she has such good glute genetics. I always show her program, which is on bodybuilding.com. It has her workout, mm. and I can tell it's like her real workout. I don't think it's her fake. workout. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> but. but it's it's like it would not even be a good warm up for Mike. I mean, it's like it wouldn't wow. even be a good warm up. But yeah. that's all she has to do. And if she did my program, maybe she'd look too. I don't know. Like I, <laughs> I always, you know, maybe I'd make her look. Not you can't say how someone should look, but sure. for her liking, it might be too muscular. For her liking, yeah, she might get too too muscular all over and not have as much of a feminine look as she likes. But for the average person with regular glute genetics, you have to do everything possible to uh, to you get know, him, to, yeah, to just get him to, to, get, to where yeah. get, to get to glute shape. But so you, let's say you're you're looking at how much protein should I eat? And you start typing in search terms into Google. That's how we all start out. And you get on these blogs, blog posts, and it might be someone legit. It might not be, but you just start reading blogs for the most part because that's all you know. And then as you keep progressing, you stumble upon more experts and more experts and you realize, well, they disagree with one another. Or this guy thinks this, this guy thinks this. And then if you keep and, and but they might be citing scientific research too, which makes it even more confusing because you're yep. like, I don't know. I mean, right. And I remember, um, Mike, we talked about this before we started the podcast about kind of intermittent fasting and how you're going to see a little bit better. Yeah, maybe you get to see 85% of your muscle gain through that, but you have 15% left on the table if you spread your protein out more frequently. And I remember talking to Alan Aragon about that. And I just brought it up to him and he's like, okay, so this was like five years ago. And he says, okay, so there's three studies on the topic right now. The first study says this, and he summarized it for me. The second study says this, and yet the third study says this. So here's what the intermittent fasting community clings to this study. And then these people, the, you know, higher frequency people cling to this study But really, they should be considering all three studies. And so here's the problem. The average person, first of all, they don't even access have access to studies. You yes. can't read them unless you, – the reason why I can access studies is I still have my AUT login for my PhD. So I can log into my university library, yep. online library, and download the studies. If you can't do that, they're so ridiculously priced. They're like thirty dollars to buy the study. Who the yep. hell is going to do that? No one. Yep. Only do you know? Like um, do you know Deep Dive? Deep. Uh, yeah. It's Deep D Y V E. Oh, does that help you get studies for yeah, free? Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, not for free. No, no, you you pay. Like it's a legit, okay. it's a legit service. You pay. A, I think they switched to a monthly model actually now, and it's but it's affordable. Um, so I've I've liked Deep Dive. Like so, yeah, I'm not for. Well, now you know, there's like there's Research Gate. But this it's is expensive where, though. I, I just like deep dive because it's a it's an it's actually affordable and it, it it you know you are paying and 
the money is going to where it needs to go. Like it's a legit service. Okay. Um, you know, so just throwing no, that but out that's there. That's a good solution because otherwise you're going to be paying an arm and a leg and no yeah. one will do it. You just won't even do it. So you got to figure out a way to access the studies. But then even if you can access them, you, you don't have the skills to scrutinize those studies. And this is where I said it takes time. Yeah. I'm really good at scrutinizing strength and conditioning training studies because I've been a personal trainer for so many years. So if I see a study that's using one training intervention versus another and I can say, well, okay, that group's actually doing – more volume than the other that right. group's doing more this isn't a, this isn't set up fairly or maybe it's yeah that's perfect that's a perfect study design yep. i'm not so good at critiquing you know studies out of my interest and i'm not that good at statistics so first of all just to read the you read the methods and then you read the you know the how they how they're going to conduct their stats and then you read the results and then the, and that's another thing even the best stat, statistics people they all disagree with one another mm. And so the statistics in in of itself is this daunting field where you got so, you have so much to learn. Yep. And I've learned enough about certain things to form my opinion about like post hoc corrections and things like that. And I'm going, this is so stupid. Why would I do a comprehensive study measuring 10 different variables if I have to then divide alpha by 10? And now my p-value isn't 0.05, it's 0.05. It discourages good research and you just trade the likelihood of committing a type, uh, a type 1 error with a type 2 error. But... I don't, but that's all stuff that you learn as a researcher, as a PN. That probably didn't make sense to anyone listening to this. But. Exactly. That's the, that's what they run into where they're like, right. you say that and stuff and they're like, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, great. Now, and it made them feel horrible. But <laughs> what I can tell you is in eight years of being in fitness, right? I think I started blogging eight years ago, but I started personal training when I was 20. So I started lifting when I was 15. So I've been lifting for 25 years. I've been personal training for 20 years. I've been becoming more scientific for eight years, and you can. <laughs> we're gonna. This is our field. We're gonna be in it for a long time. Mm. The cool thing is, it's just like with your physique. Yeah, you might not reach your dream physique ever, but you might not reach it for five years. But each year, you look better. Yeah. And each year, as a scientist, you get better. Yep. And I, I can. I don't post a lot of my older blogs um, on. I, I, I'm embarrassed by them because I learn so much every year that it's like embarrassing to me. Yeah, I've, I've gone through stuff I've written previously and just rewritten it, honestly. Like, yeah. Just because, you. you know, certain articles were popular that they weren't, it's not like they were terrible, but there's just things where either I now have learned new things that basically like this needs to be updated or I just think it needs more context or something. I did that with my books as well. I've gone through and revised and. I'm fine with that. Like I'm fine to say that's like, how it should I've be. Absolutely, been wrong on things in the past, and I'm probably wrong on things right now. But at least I'm 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 more right than wrong, so that's good. I think at least in, with the things that matter the most in terms of getting the results I want to get with people, I'm more right than wrong, and I'm continually striving to get more right. So, and you're open minded to the fact that you're wrong about things. That's what's huge. So. That's what I tell people in my seminars. I always say like I'm. I guarantee you, I'm wrong about several things i'll tell you today uh you know five years from now i'll look back and go oh god that was wrong that was wrong we were wrong about a lot of things and that's what the, the term bro science has become popular oh that's bro science well yeah you can okay so picture this i want to get jacked and i can either and my two options of getting jacked are go to the gym and talk to 10 or like talk to five jack dudes and just kind of follow what they tell me to do or start reading about hypertrophy and like fat loss on PubMed and and researching it. Yeah. I will see so much better results if I just listen to the five jack dudes <laughs> because they can tell me all sorts of good advice. The problem is they're not scientists and so some of the stuff they tell you will be complete wrong. Yeah. Completely wrong. And so this is what I like about like what I've learned along the way about getting in shape, it doesn't have to be as hard as we thought. Like certain things we've been wrong about. I can think of a bunch of things. Hormones. We used to say, mm -hmm. and I was the king of this. I told every client, you got to do squat. You want big arms? Squat and deadlift because squats and deadlifts jack up your testosterone levels and that courses through your bloodstream and attaches to the receptors. Yeah, of everything every, grows. Every muscle cell and everything grows. That's why big dudes who squat and deadlift, they're always jacked. That's not true at all. It gets the muscles that are worked 
<laughs> more muscular and it yeah. doesn't have an effect on your biceps or the muscles that are not activated during this the squat right um we were wrong about that we were wrong about if you want to lift you want to get jacked you have to lift heavy there are now about 20 studies that show whenever it's light loads versus heavy loads as long as they're close to failure you see the same exact amount of muscle growth. There's about 22 studies on the topic now. Hmm. We've been wrong about um, fasted cardio uh, is not more beneficial than non-fasted cardio. Meal timing. We used to think you need to eat six to eight meals a day to stoke the fire. We were wrong about that. Yeah. And so you, you can eat three times a day if you want or eight times a day if you want. You can you you can you, i remember reading all the bodybuilders and it was like i'm like god they all eat chicken and like lean beef and tuna and like boiled lean, uh, lean and steamed broccoli and, and right the the steamed right. broccoli and the 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 veggies and there was the a bodybuilder like, in a gym I used to go to his thing was tilapia and asparagus yeah. that's what you tell everybody that's what all you need to eat tilapia and uh, asparagus and and they don't <laughs> he was actually kind of insane <laughs> They don't season their foods and they just <laughs> – and the, all the carb sources were always like brown rice or oats or whole wheat pasta or yeah. like whole wheat or something. And, and it's like, God, what if you wanted like a yogurt? What if you wanted some orange juice? Like what if you wanted – I was like, couldn't I just – I remember thinking this way back in the day going, why can't I just have – why couldn't I just substitute? Like, I don't always crave potatoes. I don't yeah. always crave, like, you know, sweet potatoes or whatever. I don't – sometimes I just want to have, like, I crave, like, sweet things. Sometimes I want fruit. Sometimes I want um, – you know, what if you like to drink a lot of milk? Uh, does that – you know, can you just decrease some of your meats and some of your carbs and substitute the milk in? And the bodybuilders back in the day when I was like 15 would, would say like, no, you have to eat these foods. You have yeah. to eat clean. And then like it was interesting to see this flexible dieting thing get more popular because, you know, you see like Ronnie Coleman video DVDs back in the day. And it's like he's put, putting barbecue sauce on things and he's uh, eating his French fries and he yeah. he's doing flexible dieting whether yeah. he knows it or not. And same same with some of these other bodybuilders. And then you realize that. It doesn't make a b big difference if you substitute as long as most of your foods are – because most people aren't like, okay, I have to get – I can get 300 grams of carbs a day. I'm going to get them all from Pop-Tarts. Most yeah. people don't – most people – but it, the reason why it's important is because it increases adherence. You yes. stick to the plan and I used to be a terrible trainer. I thought I was amazing but when I had my personal training studio, they all – stuck to the bc diet <laughs> that's what i called it my initials yeah it's like a palm sized portion of meat and then and then fill the fill the rest of the plate with salad or veggies and eat that like six times a day and it, I, and people would get shredded and it was so irresponsible of me because they get shredded and, and then they're I, like binge time right and then uh, you know month one they lose 25 pounds and they're so psyched well, if they're overweight, obviously, some yeah, people sure. need to gain weight. And, and if they need to gain weight, I'd have them have car, a bunch of cars. But like I gave them this rigid system that that was – they'd be on the system, they'd see great results. They'd get off the system and they'd blow up. I did not teach them a sustainable system. So I, my dumb ego at the time, I thought, God, they need these people need me to see results. It's pretty <laughs> pathetic. But when they're with me, they get, see great results. When they're not, they're not. Right. That's my – dumbass fault for teaching them for not teaching them a flexible system i was feeding them a fish not teaching them how to fish and so yeah. i've learned a lot from those days you know what 10 whatever 10 you know 12 years ago but um this is how we we all evolve we all start you if you if you don't look back at the stuff you were saying five years ago and cringe a little bit then you're not learning enough you're not yeah. studying enough and so how i think so, that applies to any area of your life i mean i think like if you look back at your worldview and the ideas you have about pretty much everything and, you know, if not much has changed in five years or if you're not looking back going like, oh, that was pretty dumb, uh, then you're not, you're not growing as an individual. I mean, sure, yeah. there are some principles and values and things that we should probably just kind of stick to and shouldn't change all that much. But, you know, maybe how we manifest them or embody them can change. But I think that applies to a lot more than just what we're talking about. But so, so how can someone... You know, how do you become more scientific? How do you so? All right, 
you got to use learn how to use Google PubMed and Google Scholar to search for things and try to find the studies. If someone's mentioning a a, a study in a blog post, type in the title that highlight the title and hit search. Search on Google for and it. And also, if you add file type colon PDF and then put the title into Google, just throwing that out there. If it is just out there somewhere, Google will pull it up. Um, right, because a lot of times someone uploaded this yep. to a forum or a server somewhere, and you can actually get the full paper. Yep. So, um, so it's nice. So then you can peruse it. You won't understand everything, but like I said, becoming a good scientist takes time. If you do this for a couple of years, you'll start to figure it out. You'll start to be a, become a lot better at it. The I would thing also is, say, I, I don't know if you agree, I would interject and say that it, it, what really helped me is um, diving into the terminology and the jargon and, and, yep. and understanding the words. <laughs> like I kind yes. of started there. What are the words these people are using and what do they mean? So um, I was kind of sensitive right. to that. So yeah. look up words. Don't just skim over. Yeah. If you're studying biomechanics and it's, and let's because a lot with, of these, let's start with biomechanics. Make sure you understand what that word means. Right, right. You know what I mean? well, a lot of like things have acronyms. RFD. What is? It? Don't just skim over. That. Go back and find what does RFD mean? Rate of force bump. What does that mean? Yep. Okay, it's the slope of the. You know. So like, but I okay. In a perfect world, we would have like there'd be thirty studies on every single thing we wondered about. Yeah. And enough to have a meta analysis. Yep. And review papers where you're like, okay, what, uh, you know, think it's of it. It's all just tied up with a nice little bow. and Right. Yeah. And we can read it and go, okay, this is pretty obvious. It's pretty yeah. clear that this is superior to this. This is what I need to be doing. But <clears throat> the, a lot of the, for research, a lot of it's what gets funded because, you know, follow the money. The, the people need money to conduct research. Universities need money and things like that. So, the things that get funded the most are like cancer research and obesity cr problems in the world that are crises and a lot of and, our and stuff not having big biceps unfortunately right, right. big <laughs> biceps doesn't not, rank very I, highly it's not the highest list on the priority so you're not <laughs> I don't know if that's on the CDC anywhere right, my right. <laughs> we have a small Maybe biceps we epidemic. It. it's a good predictor of like you know all uh, uh, all cause mortality or something, and we, you know, you, you but anyway, not you, getting you, late enough, right? <laughs> right, right. So there's not a, there's not always a lot of studies. Sometimes there are no studies, and that's what's frustrating for me. Uh, sometimes I'll be like, okay, there has to be a study on this topic, and I search for it, and I can't find it. So sometimes it's because you don't know the right terms to search for, yeah, and that's a that. whole skill in and of itself. Is what the hell terms do I use? So like. If you're thinking of like the pump, is the pump is getting a good pump good for hypertrophy? So what the hell do you type in? So I'd start it with Google and go like, you know, is the pump good for? And you yeah, have to maybe even pump. like study muscle pump or something, and, and then see if right. you can just get lucky, basically. And, and but the studies use the term cell swelling, and that's what yeah. Brad Schoenfeld linked. So this cell swelling research. So it's not called, but Brad and I have a paper called the muscle pump. <laughs> that's published in SCJ, but I actually don't think that's linked to PubMed. So mm. you'd find it on Google, but not necessarily PubMed. But you have to learn the terminology, and that takes time. So, so over time, you want to learn the best researchers on the topic. You want to learn the best labs. You want to learn the best journals. And you can even subscribe. Do you want to drop any names just in your, like, you know, yeah, pe sure. people, are, people are wondering, I'm sure. Yeah, so for hypertrophy, it's, it's it's Brad Schoenfeld and Stu Phillips. Okay. But the best journals, if you're studying, want to study hypertrophy, there's Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research. There's EJAP, uh, European Journal of Applied Physiology. There's uh, Scandinavian Journal of Sports Medicine. There's Journal of Science and Sports Medicine. What else? I know I'm missing some. But anyway, you got to learn these. Oh, Medicine and Science and Medicine. I mean, you science and exercise like the ms i always just know the acronyms like yeah, sure. yeah, ssc yeah. jscr but anyway i go through all these journals every single month month in and month out yeah, as you, say, you should tell people about because this is uh i mean I, i've found your work in this regard very helpful and you know aragon's review helpful and well so okay so if you're okay so like first of all there's good people to follow online like 
my colleague Chris Beardsley, he makes infographics every day of these studies. It helps make sense oh, cool. of them. He also has an awesome blog if you're into strength and conditioning and biomechanics. But you should be following these people on social media because they'll uh, – and tw Twitter. Twitter is actually really good for following scientists. I follow so many of them, and they mm. – <laughs> whenever they publish a new study, they link it. And uh, so that's important. But you, so, I mean, I think a good takeaway here is immersion. You have to immerse yourself yes. in it. You don't want to, it's not enough to, even I would say if just reading some of my stuff, like if that's all you're doing, if you're a person listening, that's not enough if you really want to get to uh, the, the level where, like Brett was saying, where you're kind of becoming your own guru. You have to really fully immerse yourself. I don't, I don't pretend I'm a scientist. I just am trying to disseminate good facts and serve a, a, a certain market uh, place and help people, you know, get into shape and so forth. And um, I do what, what Brett is talking about, where I read a lot of stuff and I follow people who I trust and that helps a lot. And I'll throw one other thing out that helped me along the way is looking for meta analyses and review papers on things that like, if I want to know about something, I'll start there. Cause if there is something I found, those are, uh, I mean, they just helped me a lot, just kind of get my feet wet and, and get an understanding of, you know, where we're at. Uh, in, in the, not all, of course, some are better than others, but it just definitely helped me because they're also written, I found, like a bit more conversationally. And you don't, you don't need to have tremendous technical knowledge necessarily to at least understand what you're reading about. Yeah, there are some words you're going to have to clarify, but it did it. That, 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 you know, still helps me today. I still do, I still do that. Well, so this is where it gets a little intimidating and daunting, but it is important to know this. Okay, so let's say I wanted to let's say I wanted to say what's better for my quads, the leg press or the squat. Okay, how would I answer that question as a researcher? Well, I could have them. I could use a force plate and show that oh, they're they're pressing more, they're utilizing more force with the leg press than the squat, so that's better. I could utilize EMG and put electrodes on them and say, well, actually their vastus lateralis and medialis activity is actually higher in the leg, in the squat than the leg press, so that's better. I could use all sorts of tools that we have in sports science. We utilize force plates, EMG, ultrasound, uh, isoconnect dynamometers, um, motion capture, uh, you know, we, we utilize, we have our tools of the trade and we have our ways of answering things, but these are all mechanisms we're studying. Really, you need a training study because we can come up with all sorts of yeah. cool nifty theories. Yeah. But uh, Richard, does it translate? That if if yeah. theory does not match experiments, then it's wrong. No matter how eloquent or yeah. how logical it seems, it, it's wrong. So the, the, the experiments have to match. So you have to have training studies. We call them so mechani they're mechanistic studies, which are cross-sectional. They these are good for like researchers because they usually can you can collect all the data in a couple of weeks. But when you do a training study, which is longitudinal, now you have to have an intervention, and it's a pain in the ass because you got to train. Just to people. define that, meaning it just it's over time. It's going to take. Huh? Yeah, just so people know what you're talking about. Yeah. So you have to take like however long you make the training study. Maybe it's eight weeks long. Yep. You got to pre-test them. Train them for eight weeks and then post test them. And there's so much involved in these studies, but everything has a an inherent flaw with it. EMG, EMG measures the electrical activity of muscles. It doesn't exactly predict the growth. There's more things to muscle growth than just the electrical signal. And there's things that can Im impact the electrical signal too, especially mm -hmm. with fatigue. Force plates, cool. That shows you ground reaction force, but it doesn't show you the muscle for the individual muscle forces. Yep. Uh, even with things like muscle modeling, where you use these complex models to determine things, well, that relies on assumptions made by the author. To model things, you have to make assumptions. Yep. When you do review papers, that's these authors' interpretation of the research. You might have a different. You're, they might have biases. Yep. Uh, even in review papers, even in meta analysis, you have to set the. The guidelines as yeah, the what, parameters, as, yeah, yeah, the parameters of what you'll accept, yep. and it might you and might that can be a hundred percent bias, like you're saying, like that could be a, uh, the research. There's an agenda here, and they are going to be pre-selecting for what they want, type of thing. 
Now, the good thing is most researchers are in it for the right reasons. Right. Um, Especially, I mean, I would say, I think, I don't know if you'd agree, but in, in the strength and conditioning space, it seems like if we were talking something with a ton of money involved, like pharmaceutical, eh, then, then maybe it, it's harder to know really what's going down yeah. in some cases when you have billions of dollars floating around. Absolutely. And so um, you do have, you know, rumors come out of this person's a bad egg and, you know, but... There really are not most of us, and I think the guys I mentioned earlier, all the guys who I follow and they follow yeah. me, we give each other the benefit of the doubt. We don't always agree with each other, but we yeah. know that, you know that like we 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 talk a lot, and we'll you wouldn't do that if you were, weren't trying to uncover the truth. Yeah, we're all like in the matrix trying to figure out what the hell the the answer is and. <laughs> And we're trying to figure out. We all we all know we don't have all the answers, but we. Uh, it's good trying to, to get have that colleagues. red pill. Yeah, we all. It's good to have colleagues, and that's something that took me a lot of time. Is uh, when I started out, I had no friends in the industry, and now I'm friends with all the top people, and I'm. I do not take that for granted. It's I'm yeah. so lucky to have a phone call away all these people. But anyway, it, it, what do you do? Do when you want to? What's studies that? when there's when there's conflicting studies, what you mentioned earlier, right. one study shows this, one study shows this, and the average person is not skilled enough to say, okay, this study had only twelve subjects. This study had well, that, I think that's a good segue into. Do you want to give a couple examples of what you know poor design or poor execution might look like? And if you have any examples that come off the top of your head, sure, you know if they're. I'll t I think of one classic one that I always talk about. This yeah. one made me so mad because it got it got. Um, all the Olympic weightlifter types like posted on Facebook and social media to say like, look, Olympic weightlifting is superior to kettlebells. And uh, th what made me mad is that the study design looked at like an Olympic weightlifting protocol versus a kettlebell training protocol on functional performance, like vertical jump and things like that. Okay. Okay. If you were going to do that, you would say, all right, the, you have to equate – like load and effort as much as you can. Right. The problem is there aren't kettlebells that go up and up. But in this study, I think the heaviest kettlebell, kettlebells they used were like 16 kgs or something. That's like 35 pounds. Yeah. So here you have one group doing like front squats and like hang cleans and stuff with like a shit ton of weight. And then yeah. the other group using these light ass kettlebells to doing do like, like goblet squats or something. Little goblet squats and swings with – and it, and that would be all fine and dandy – if they didn't make heavy kettlebells, but they do. I have a, I have a 203 pounder. I have a 106 pounder. I have a 157 pounder. So you could have just used heavier dumbbells or yeah. heavier kettlebells. Yeah, yeah. make study. them work. And then it would be more. My guess is that you'd see very similar results. But, so then, uh, then the so the question then is like a you know, person. I'm sure people listening be like, so why does that happen? Like, isn't that pretty obvious? That's just simple and logical. You don't need to have a PhD to be like, yo. So like, does that make sense that they're using thirty pound kettlebells and then you know lifting heavy ass weight? Uh, <laughs> so you you expect okay. So it's so because of humans. So science is perfect. Science is the study of the way stuff works in the universe. But humans are flawed. Our brains are flawed. We have biases. We have... And we have bank accounts. We have, and we, have <laughs> we have bank accounts. We have the Dunning-Kruger effect. Yep. We have... We think we're a lot smarter than we are. Yep. We don't know. We're, we're unaware of what we're naive about. And so is peer-reviewed research better than blogs? Hell yeah. Yep. Is it perfect? Hell no. Um, yep. And so... You just need to understand that, know that, like, you know, so to get published, you got to conduct, you know, you got to get ethics approval, you conduct the study, then you submit it for publication, you go through rounds of peer review, they come back to you, they, they almost never say, oh, yep, we accept this, that's never happened to me, it's always either minor revisions, major revisions, or rejected, um, and, you know, you work with the peer reviewers, and then hopefully you can satisfy them, and then it gets accepted, but the peer reviewers might be... In that case, they were lax. Yep. Or and maybe they just maybe that wasn't their their thing. Like they would they don't know enough about training to really know why that's sure. so important. So you know? in, ideally, you can get peer reviewers um, that know the subject matter well. But that that's <laughs> peer reviewing is free. It's not. A, yep. I get asked to peer review all the time, and I always accept. I always have like one article on peer reviewing, but I have to reject a lot because I don't have 
time. Sure. So there are flaws with research because of humans. And it's good, you know, but like I said, you might, if, if early on in your career you read that study, you'd be like, oh, Olympic lifting is way better than kettlebells. And then as you become more advanced, you could see the flaws in the study design. And that's one good thing about forums. You know, forums, they can be good and they can be really bad. But sometimes in forums, you can have a smart guy that just likes to show off his knowledge and he can help point out. But you are know, there any, are there any forums that you personally participate in, or that you like? No, and okay. I've never been highly involved in any forum. But Me either, um, I don't. I can't even recommend any because. But anyway, I think that that's where you can have someone who's because it's like you. I, ideally, we'd all have someone to teach us. Like, okay, here's the problem with this study. It, yeah. it, it does show this. It doesn't show. You know, uh, uh, Brad just posted just published a paper last year or the year before on rest time in between sets and showed that three minutes was better than one minute okay for both strength and hypertrophy well he didn't look at two minutes maybe two minutes was ideal he didn't look at that and the other thing is so the three minutes good it's better for hypertrophy but it takes longer yeah so they equated volume or they equated like number of sets but what if you instead took a different look at it and said in 20 i've got yeah 30 minutes to work out What's should better? i be resting three minutes they didn't equate like I have a thirty-minute window. Yeah, they're yeah. saying you have you have infinite time. Who cares? Yep. Yeah. Right. So that's a whole different design and question. So it takes so long to get to that point, but yep. you get better every. Well, and then few that's months, where you can bit. learn to make educated guesses yourself, and at least you're coming from a place of some understanding. So you know. And oh, which by the way, uh, that's a perfect way to wrap that's this part up is to say, look, you're never. I like the term science-based or evidence-based because evidence is, evidence is comes from in all forms. Yeah. It's not just published research. I always say this: your knowledge comes in, in well, your knowledge in strength and conditioning and fitness and nutrition, all that comes in three parts. It's like a a, a pie chart, you know. One third one third of your knowledge is from what you've learned working with yourself and training yourself, mm -hmm. going to the gym, lifting weights. Yeah. Where people, trying different, there's things that no one can tell you that didn't work or, you know what I mean? Right. You know, they're just trying different diets, trying supplements. And you realize that didn't work. That did nothing. I just wasted my money. Um, and, and that's a third of your knowledge, but we're very unique. And actually when you publish research, this is what you learn. Okay. This is a whole different topic. I don't want to get too, so, so I'll, I'll address this in a minute. The other third comes from what you learned working with other people. Mm -hmm. If all you've done is work by yourself, then you just tell you're, – you're, this is my problem with people who go to non-coaches on Instagram and stuff. And will you yeah. write me a program? That person will just give you the exact program he does. And it may or may not work well for you or she, he or she. And they don't haven't worked with enough people to individualize it towards you. Yeah. And I can't tell you how much different we all are and how much I've learned just from working with so many different people. You, you learn so much. And when you study the research on genetics and individuality, it's crazy. I'll, I'll elaborate on in a minute. Then the final third is what you learn through reading research, attending seminars and conferences, reading blogs, reading articles. Education, yeah. Education, exactly. So it's one third, one third, one third. So any, if you don't train people, you can't. Uh, you're I, I missing out on, yeah. Yeah, you're missing out. If you don't lift weights yourself. I look at some strength coaches who don't lift weights and I'm like, how can you evaluate a new exercise or protocol yeah. if you don't try it out yourself? Yeah. And then if you just learn through <laughs> training yourself and training others and never read anything or try to learn, then you're missing out. So it's all three. And so you'd never want to ignore your personal experiences. You just have to know that, you know, that's an N equals one or that's a, yeah. that N equals one means one person. Yeah. It's not a, you, it's, you know. It can, it can be, I mean, at least it gives context, but it, it, it isn't necessarily... You could have had uh, an law. outlier. I mean, yeah, you could have had an outlier who yep. would respond really well to anything, or who wouldn't respond to anything. That's why you need ample sample size to wash out the effects of, yeah. you know, of of individuality. But speaking of individuality, when you actually publish data, when you actually conduct experiments, it's really cool because you can see, like, I've conducted so many EMG experiments on my clients, probably thirty different clients at least. And I can tell you that, you know, 
Some people, their glutes activate more when they go heavier and heavier in the hip thrust. Some people do not. Some people top out at 50% of one rep max and their glutes don't activate more. But they can do way more reps with lighter loads. So I'd be stupid to give those people heavy hip thrusts. Some people use their glutes well during the, the – the, some people get more glute activation in a light goblet squat compared to a heavy back squat. Same with kettlebell deadlifts versus conventional deadlifts. Other people not. Yep. Um, some people don't use their glutes to lock out the deadlift very much. Hmm. Some people do. And, it's, and you look at their form and it looks pretty good. Some people get a lot of glute activity versus abduction exercises mm -hmm. and other people not. And so what I do is I, I'll, EM, I'll test these people with their muscle activity and then I'll write them a program based on what works best for them. And then I see, I see amazing results with my clients this way. Mm. But the problem is there's no place giving you know extensive EMG testing where you can go in, hook your muscles up to electrodes and do a bunch of different exercises and say, this is what works best for me. Yep. So how do you, so how do you, <laughs> how do you make judgments? Well, you use the research, but you also just pay attention while you're lifting, you know? people are usually right when they say, I feel my muscles working yeah. more when I do it this way compared yeah. to this player. I like this technique. And I've read all the bodybuilders back in the day. I would read, I loved reading what they, because it gave me new things to try. But it didn't, I didn't always like it more. It just, you try enough things and you learn, I like this technique. I, you know, I never liked wide grip seated rows. I don't mm. feel it at all. Some mm. people love them. Yeah. But it's very arrogant to think, oh, because I don't like them. No one else will. That's why you, you work with people. And you get this large toolbox as a personal trainer when you work with a ton of people. Yeah. And I can always find a great program for someone. I can yep. help them arrive at it because of my toolbox. Because you've been there when they say, yeah, that doesn't work for me. You understand that. And you're like, I, yeah, okay. If that one doesn't work for you, especially if you understand biomechanics like you do, you can be like, all right, cool. Then why don't we try this and see if that makes sense. But we're talking strength and conditioning. It's the same way with nutrition. It's the same way with um, – so my buddy James Krieger and I wrote an article on individual differences. And it's crazy. Things you don't think about. But, oh, real quick. When you publish the data, you see this whole range of responses. And if you plot them – you see this guy, whether it's EMG or, train, or strength gains or muscle size gains, this person gained 20% increased hypertrophy. This person lost 3%. Mm. He, he worked out for eight weeks and lost 3% of his muscle mass. How did that happen? <laughs> and, and everything in the middle. It's like so mysteries. You have the mean, but then you yeah. have the range, you know, yeah. the max and the minimum, the extremes. And so – you see, like, if I would have given put this person, this, this, and so then you can think of your clients and go, okay, like, I know that I've looked at Brad, Brad Schoenfeld and James Krieger's meta-analyses on volume, on frequency, on all these things, but I have my client that seems to get a lot of muscle damage. She doesn't recover fast. Mm -hmm. If I give her too much, I run her into the ground. Yep. I have to train her with less volume and less frequency. Yep. But she's, I've, I've come across a lot of people like that, probably, honestly, because a lot of my crowd are I would say um, mid twenties, thirties, and and above. Um, so I've seen that with people, not so much in their twenties, but definitely with people even my age. I'm thirty two, and then people in their forties. That yeah, theoretically it might be better if they were to to get a bit more weekly volume or even up the intensity, but the recovery is just not there. So research gives you a good starting point, but only you can determine what works best for you. And things that people don't think about. Okay. You want to start doing HIT training, high intensity interval training. Does it make you hungrier? Does mm -hmm. it affect your sleep? Yep. Does it then make you less motivated during your strength workout? How do the you know? Um, does it affect your neat? Are you sluggish the rest of the day? Yep. All these things matter. It's not just this black or white. Well, the research says this. I want to know what happens when you start doing high intensity interval training. If it doesn't impact your sleep, and it blunts your appetite. And it tends to get you supercharged the next yeah, day. Yeah, and you don't well, and you don't mind it. You're willing to do it. Yeah, and it's not that grueling for you. Then great. But if it for me, it interferes with my sleep. Mm. It, it it just puts it, too much it, stress on your body. I get hungry as hell, and it's hard because I'm going. You can give me a macro plan, and I won't stick to it because yeah. I wake. I have trouble sleeping, and then finally, I'm like, my stomach's growling in the middle of the night. What are you gonna do? I, yeah. I like, sleep is actually more important than hitting my macros, I'm going to eat. I'm going to raid the fridge so I can freaking sleep. Yeah. And so 
you have to consider all these different things and everyone's different and yep. that's <laughs> science is science is perfect it's the, it's the study of the universe and the way things work this is published research is one component to science the scientific method is a component of science it's so don't, never blame science itself you can blame humans and you can <laughs> You can blame, but it's an it's an evolving process, and we all should get, we all should very much care about science. We all should strive to be scientific because not only will you see better results, you'll also save a lot of money, not falling for gimmicks. Yep, and that, that and that's a big part of what I just uh, that's part of my story essentially is, and what I was what I even why I even got to this was why I originally fo wrote the first book that I wrote was basically that like. God, I could have saved so much time and money and just frustration if I would have just known like 10 things. Uh, and so I'm going to put those 10 things in a book and try to make them really easy to understand. And, and that's there. That was the beginning was like, here, here's a tears. Here's, here's me writing a book for old, you know, past me, uh, at, you know, whatever. It's eight years ago. This is what I wish I would have been. I wish someone would have given me this book because shit, it would have been much, uh, I, I would, I would be much further ahead than I, than I am now. You know what I mean? So anyway, I, this I think this is a good ending point for yep. we've we've hit up this we've hit this topic really well, and then maybe down the road you can have me on and we can discuss other topics. But I'm really glad we we addressed this because it's such a critical topic, and uh, and no one talks about it enough, you know. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. You know what also will make a what might make an interesting follow up discussion is just because you stay on top of the research in the way that you do, uh, it might be cool if if there were enough material to fill a podcast of. So you know we have the basics of fat loss and muscle and strength building. You know at least we we have those puzzle pieces on the board and we see how they kind of fit together. What the variables are, it's taped to to one degree or another. I think the. If we're using the puzzle analogy, it's probably this puzzle. We just don't know how far it goes and we don't know what the whole picture is and it's going to continue for the rest of our lives. But at least we've come to, I think, a good basic understanding, um, you know, and, and now we're looking at as things, just like you were saying earlier with the protein, like, okay, we, we can all agree that eating a relatively high protein diet is conducive to muscle building and strength gain. Cool. And now we're talking about optimizing. So how, okay, so how frequently, how much, da, 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 what types of protein uh, and so forth. So maybe we could have a discussion on some of the more interesting research that have, that has come out recently and what's on the horizon and kind of like, it's almost just what is really, what's got your attention. You know what I mean? There, I, uh, yeah, I, some things right away come to mind. Cool. And uh, then um, we should, so we should, that, we should line it up. It'd be fun. Like I'm interested. Yeah. I know. I think a lot of listeners would be interested as well. Yeah. A lot of people aren't aware. There's some interesting controversies, uh, right now in the field and a couple of, researchers out there mixing it up and we need to get to the bottom of it but yeah that would make for a good follow-up so mike this has been great i very much enjoyed talking to you before the podcast and talking shop and then having you on it you asked really good questions so i appreciate you having me on absolutely and i'd love to come on whenever you want yeah let's do it again and let's before we end here let's just let everybody know where they can find you um and if you have any particular products or services that you think they should know about in particular so it, uh the name is Brett Contreras. If you don't remember my name, Brett Contreras, you can type in the glute guy. Yep. Uh, I'm big on And this glute. is actually why I didn't want to have you on to talk glutes because I was like, dude, he's every I, – I, he'll just – I want him to like – I want to do just for his sake. Let's talk about right. something else. Right. Thank you. Yeah, every podcast is just all glutes. The yeah, whole time. so that's uh, I actually right. thought that would get your attention. Place. Like, oh, someone right. that actually wants to talk about something other than yeah, glutes. Yeah, no, this was good. And and I, I love talking about other things. But if you type in the glute guy or Brett Contreras, you get my blog. And from my blog, you can find all my social media channels. I'm on Twitter. I'm on mm -hmm. Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm on YouTube. And I have a blog. And I have a newsletter. And I never spam people. I don't do affiliate stuff. It's yep. just... Same. Here's my articles that I came out with yep, and same. here's the stuff I'm working on. And, you know, so I, so I only send out like one newsletter a month, but yep. it's all the stuff that I've been doing. And so you can subscribe to that. And, and then the research yep. review again, I mean, it's topical, obviously this is what we're talking about. Yep. I've got the research review, uh, which I do with Chris Beardsley. That's called strength and conditioning research. And that's a good blog. You want to be reading that blog, uh, cause Chris puts out really good material on that yeah, blog. I like it. Yeah. So and I like and, how much like it's it's you guys do a good job explaining things um, in a way that anyone can understand them, which is is helpful and appreciated. 
Thank you. It's not always easy with biomechanics. No, but. yeah, yeah, I understand. Okay, awesome. So I think that's everything. Thanks again, Brett. Great conversation. I know everyone's going to like it. I think like we it. kept this under an hour, which is a miracle with me. So Same, I'm actually. To like, that, that's, <laughs> I, that's probably one of the most common YouTube comments I get is like, yo, these are cool, but they're like really long. <laughs> and I'm just like, ah, whatever. That's, that, it's a podcast. Yeah. So I, I, started doing I, shorter, they, I started doing was, shorter videos to, to appease, you know, so the, well, I think it was a good strategy. We talked ourselves out a little bit before that we recorded. So yeah, true. We've got some fatigue going on. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks again, and we'll we'll, we'll line up the next one. And uh, yeah, I appreciate you taking the time. Thanks, Mike.